So welcome everyone to this to this um, session of our lecture series. Uh, my name is Bernardo Jurema. I am a research associate at the project uh, um, uh, uh, working here at the uh, Justice in Sustainability uh, um, um, uh, project. And uh, we will begin with uh, my, my colleague Enrique Knappe. Uh, she will uh, introduce our lecture series. And yeah, so Enrique, please. Uh, Hi, thank you, Bernardo. Uh, a very warm welcome also from my side. Uh, this is our fourth public lecture for this focal topic year. So, um, and I'm really excited to have Lia Temper here today who's speaking about, um, yeah, environmental justice and uh, concerns about it. And she will be introduced in a minute, as Bernardo said, and I just want to say a few words about our focal topic so that you know what the context of this lecture is actually. So we chose um, at the ISS to uh, put a focal topic on uh, justice and sustainability in order to kind of um, deepen our understanding of the nexus between justice concerns and sustainability. And as we have now Leah Temper with us today, I think this is um, perfect in this regard because with environmental justice, we are going back to the roots of thinking justice and environmental politics together. And um, I think this idea of um, uh, people and regions and groups being unequally affected by environmental hazards, but also by climate change is also one core idea of uh, justice and sustainability as we see it. But besides from this direct effectiveness, I would say, what we are interested in the ISS specifically is also uh, to look at the policy instruments and transformation mechanisms that are put in place to tackle environmental problems and climate change and how they also can, of course, create inequalities, but maybe can also be used <laughs> to uh, yeah, mitigate inequalities or even uh, do justice to groups, people, or certain regions, for example. So that's, um, I think, a specific focus of the ISS here. And um, I think that's why it's also really great to have Leah here. And we um, kind of want to further explore and understand uh, those intersections and also complexities between inequalities and sustainability politics and climate change and so forth, and kind of uncover also all those links that are there that we, for example, also see when we look at current events, for example, the war against Ukraine, where all those social justice concerns also come to the surface with regard to higher energy prices and so on and so forth. So I think there's a lot to better understand and investigate in this regard. And that's why I'm really happy to have Leah here today. And um, if you want to yeah, hear more about this, if you want to get news of what we are doing besides the public lecture series, then please also visit our website or subscribe to our newsletter. And now I um, hand over to Elias, who's, who will be introducing our guest today. Thank you, Henrike. Um, my name is Elias König. Uh, I'm one of the social justice fellows um, here at the ISS this year. And uh, I was given the task to introduce the next speaker uh, Leah Temper, after repeatedly voicing my excitement about tonight's lecture, so I'm happy to share the excitement with you all. Um, the first time that I came across Leah Temper's work was actually when I was writing my bachelor thesis already, and since then I've kind of been following her work, and uh, so I'm very excited about tonight. For those of you who are not familiar with her work, um, Leah Temper is a scholar activist, I think, in the best sense of the word. So both uh, an uh, ecological economist based at McGill University um, uh, and also at uh, the Autonomous University of Barcelona, but also a filmmaker and involved in a, vari a variety of projects such as the um, Global Atlas of Environmental Justice, um, the research um, sorry, the leadership for the um, Ecozoic program and the Acknowledge project, which stands for the 
activist academic co-production of knowledge for environmental justice. Uh, I'm sure she will tell us about some of these projects um, in her lecture as well. Uh, the lecture will be titled um, The Transformative Power of Resistance Against Extractivism. And uh, as I understand, um, Leah will draw on a forthcoming book that she has co-edited along with Mariana uh, Walter and Eugenia Rodriguez, um, in which the authors encourage us to take a radical approach to transformative research, um, a militant particularism that recognizes the agency and autonomy of environmental justice movements, but at the same time does not lose sight of the global connections between those different actors. So I, for one, have learned a lot from her work and I'm looking forward to learning more today. Um, and yeah, without uh, further ado, uh, Leah Temper, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? So it's a real pleasure to be presenting to you today. And um, I'll be sharing particularly work from the Acknowledge Project. And it's actually interesting because uh, the Acknowledge Project in many ways was actually got its start at the IASS in Potsdam that I attended. Uh, it's the Acknowledge is part of the Transformations to Sustainability program uh, of the International Social Science Council. And actually the first meeting that was held for these projects that were just actually seed projects at the time was at ISS. And I was, uh, I was able to attend in person back then. So when you contacted me, I thought that was interesting, sort of full circle as we uh, are gearing up to, to present this book. Um, so I'm really happy to be presenting this Earth Day lecture. And um, yeah, I'll be talking about the transformative power of resistance against extractivism. Uh, so I will start my PowerPoint now. Let me just share my screen. There we go. And I will put it on slideshow. Can everybody see this? Wonderful. Uh, so today the structure of the lecture is I'm first going to uh, define what we mean when we talk about uh, transformative environmental justice or transformations towards environmental justice. I'll introduce the Acknowledge Project briefly. I'm gonna talk about some of our methods, uh, how we have studied these transformations within the Acknowledge Project, uh, introduce some of the case studies, and then do sort of a broad overview of some of the learnings about uh, transforming power that uh, we've come out of the, the project. And I realize, okay, let me just, I can't see the time there, but now I have my phone. Uh, so, of course, uh, everybody is talking about transitions and transformation. Uh, it's, it's a big buzzword. Uh, however, uh, most of the time, uh, discussions around transitions are really based on, uh, focused on technological solutions and managerial approaches. Uh, so, you know, this sort of thinking of, well, how can we transition everybody to EV vehicles uh, or reduce consumption in different ways? Um, and uh, within the work that we've been doing, uh, we take a very different perspective on transformation, uh, really considering transformation as bottom up citizen led processes that are shaped through processes of resistance. And, and uh, here you can see this is uh, Elias mentioned some work that I've been engaged in for the past 10 years or so. Uh, the Global Atlas of Environmental Justice. So this is a project that uh, tracks and documents these bottom-up movements against extractivism, uh, these resistance movements. To date, uh, it's documented about 3,661 cases. 
And uh, we really aim to understand in greater detail uh, the potential agency of these movements. And um, in that previous slide, you might have seen that there was a reference to labor unions. Uh, so, you know, we have noted that uh, strikes by labor movements have been documented uh, and tracked for over 100 years or so. But uh, until today, there's actually no international body that's really considering uh, environmental justice movements and place-based movements in the same terms as the same force. But we really uh, look at how they are actually shaping environmental futures. Uh, so we make a distinction between transitions and transformations, uh, focusing on the necessity of uh, radical shifts and really aiming to refocus who the agents of the transformative change need to be. Uh, we believe that environmental justice because of its focus on intersectionality, um, multidimensionality, and the structural fo focus is really well placed to contribute to an understanding of transformations. And um, most of the literature has not really engaged with social movements sufficiently. So when we talk about a resistance centered uh, or an environmental justice perspective on transformation, what we're really talking about is processes of transformation where communities are claiming justice for themselves or through nature, through these processes of resistance, as well as the active construction of alternatives. Uh, these struggles intersect uh, and combine with other struggles against different forms of oppression, including racism, patriarchy, sexism, ableism, capitalism. Uh, we understand transformation as occurring as a result of productive conflict. Uh, so we see conflict as a productive force, not something to be avoided or to be resolved. Uh, and that through these conflicts, uh, different types of power can be transformed. And I'm going to talk about that uh, in more detail later, how we understand these different transformations of power. And also that through these type of resistance, uh, a major piece is the creation of these new subjectivities, new relations and new institutions. Uh, and here's another a modification of um, the work, drawing from the work of Nancy Fraser, uh, that I think is also helpful in understanding uh, what we mean or how we can conceptualize transformative change versus affirmative changes. Uh, so if we think of some of the environmental justice is often described as uh, having three dimensions claims for distribution or redistribution, claims for recognition of a cultural identity, and claims for representation or participation. Uh, and uh, Nancy Fraser has conceptualized how we would look at these uh, changes or these transformations taking place either in an affirmative way or a transformative way. So if we think about distribution, uh, the affirmative approach is saying, well, we need to just transfer resources between one group and another so that everybody has the same, everybody has an equal distribution of resources. Um, and this is kind of, if we think about it in environmental justice, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States, that's kind of how they define environmental justice. They say there should be, everybody should be equally polluted right? As long as we're all polluted equally, that's okay. Um, whereas a more transformative approach is really saying, what are the root causes of these inequalities? And how do we have, how can we transform the entire system so that nobody needs to be exposed to these pollutants? Um, so for example, if we look at the uh, principles of environmental justice, that uh, emerged from the, um, the conference uh, uh, on the um, people of color. They say 
they basically ask for the cessation of all toxics, that these materials should not be produced at all anymore. It's not about distributing them more equally. Uh, the same thing with recognition. So affirmative approaches are really based on mainstream multiculturalism, affirmative action, so on and so forth. Uh, whereas the transformative approach is really about the deconstruction uh, of the cultural structures as we know. So one example uh, that um, Fraser uses is that idea of queering. How do we, how does queering things help us to understand differently our own identities? Um, so in terms of uh, environmental justice, we can understand this, uh, you know, and for example, the rights of nature, how do we understand nature's agency uh, and how does that understanding therefore change our own understanding of, of our role as humans. And uh, similarly with participation, uh, is it just about participatory parity where everybody participates in the existing structures on the same terms? Or how do we really understand about reframing and reclaiming the different scales of justice and recreating new institutions for participation? Uh, so this is the introduction to the Acknowledge project. Uh, Acknowledge uh, was uh, kind of came together uh, based on different existing initiatives. Uh, three of the main ones was the work on the Environmental Justice Atlas, uh, the work of uh, two confluences. One of them is called the Vikalp Sangam in India that is led by Ashish Kotari. Ashish Kotari was the co-director of the Acknowledge Project, uh, and he's involved in, in many initiatives in India. The Vikalp Sangam is called the Alternatives Confluence. So it was bringing together different movements across India that were working on alternatives. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later. And then also um, there was an initiative is in Latin America, that was uh, serendipitously also called the Confluencias uh, Network that was working on conflict transformation. So really uh, the project was drawing from those uh, three initiatives together with other partners around the world with the aim of understanding and supporting uh, social transformation and resistance to extractive activities from the ground up through a collaborative, uh, grounded, hybrid activist uh, academic approach. Uh, so through the project, we developed a different conceptual frameworks for understanding transformation that were really attendant to the different forms of power, the dimensions of change and the scales of transformation, uh, and also attendant to some of these more hidden forms of resistance. As uh, James, there's a quote by James C. Scott where he says, you know, as the Lord passes, the farmer bows and farts. So this is, you know, under kind of showing some of these uh, more hidden forms of resistance that we also uh, need to be attendant to that are not perhaps so overt because it's not always possible to resist uh, openly. So now I'm going to turn to talking about the conflict transformation framework that is really uh, a key, has really guided a lot of the work within the project. Um, and so this framework allows us to understand the different forms of power that need to be transformed uh, to lead to transformations to environmental justice. And we analyze uh, the, the three forms of power is really understanding uh, structural power changes. So this is the power that's vested in institutions uh, in different legal, political and economic frameworks. Uh, it's kind of often what we associate like the power uh, that is associated with the state or with government or other sort of what we associate with normal power structures. Uh, and then 
what we call relational power, the power of agency. This is sort of the people power, the power of alliances, networks, and relations uh, that this exerts sort of, uh, sort of, it's a form of visible power, but perhaps not as uh, evident as um, the institutional power that we're used to. And then there's the sort of what we refer to as cultural power or discursive power. And this is the power that's really invested in different narratives, worldviews. And this power is often very invisible. We're not uh, so much aware of how these narratives and this cultural power is really shaping possibilities for action. Uh, but in many ways, it's, it's one of the most important forms of power to transform. Uh, so for each of these forms of power, we look at how movements are aiming to transform these power relations and what are the different types of strategies that they might be using uh, in order to transform power across these three areas. Uh, so, for example, uh, to institutional power, it's often engaging in different uh, democratic processes, engaging with government. Um, for the relational power, it's building networks and organizations and the production of new, no new forms of knowledge. And for the cultural power, it often looks like revitalization of local knowledge. Uh, there's, you know, histories in Latin America and across the world. Communities are increasingly uh, putting into place uh, planes de vida or life plans that's allowing them to rethink their cultural identities and uh, to create different types of counter narratives. Uh, so the project also draws on another format called the Alternatives Transformation Format. And this is a format that allows communities to assess their own processes of transformation across five overlapping spheres. Oh, there, sorry, there he goes. So the five spheres that we also look at are uh, cultural diversity and knowledge democracy, social well-being and justice, economic democracy, ecological integrity and resilience and the political sphere looking at direct and delegated democracy. And uh, this is a process that can be done together with researchers. Uh, and it's really focused on the community being able to see how their process of transformation uh, is evolving. And this uh, framework, as I mentioned previously, it emerged from this work in India, from the Vikalp Sangam process, uh, where communities across the country that are engaging in the construction of alternatives uh, put forward what they were trying to transform and how they were understanding their processes of transformation. So there might be specific questions that they would look at within each of these spheres. Uh, you know, what are the opportunities for political opportunity for political participation? What are the types of forums that exist? So on and so forth. On um, the economic sphere, do we have social control over the means of production? Um, and through the project, we also, and I won't really have time to go into this, but I just wanted to put it out there. We also had our own reflective processes for uh, looking at how we understand our role as researchers and how we are engaging with the communities that we're working with. So uh, here's some work that I uh, encourage you to explore. We recreated this tarot. It's a tarot deck of transgressive research. And we invite researchers to create their own card that represents uh, their understanding of how they do research. Uh, so that we can bring what we call political rigor into the research process. Uh, so in the project, we had uh, seven case studies. Uh, I was going to touch on three of them briefly. I see that I don't have that much time left, so we will probably be uh, quite brief. Um, 
One of them was a case study in Belgium, in Haren. Uh, it's an interesting study in the sense that uh, it involved uh, a resistance uh, against a prison so uh, it's not the normal sort of extractive project that uh, we have normally been studying but there was a prison slated to be built in a natural area uh, in a in a somewhat marginalized community and uh, it's uh, uh, triggered a, a huge resistance movement that occupied the space and um, it, this case study was written by uh, Jerome Pelenk, and he really tracks uh, the dif different processes of empowerment and the, how the capabilities have evolved through the conflict, both the individual capabilities and the collective capabilities. And of course, um, it's a very interesting analysis in how uh, you, know, you have different actors coming some more involved in uh, prison abolition, others more concerned on the um, saving the, this natural space and how together they form this new type of consciousness and this new collective political agency that allows them to really have new understandings about uh, these political questions, for example, around prisons. Uh, another case study we have is one about uh, extractivism in Canaima National Park, uh, Venezuela, that is looking at the struggle of the Pemón people. Um, so this uh, this also uh, in, an interesting case study. The struggle uh, originally began in opposition to uh, power lines. Uh, that would bring power from Venezuela to Colombia. And uh, they were contesting the installation of these power lines through their territory. Uh, they ended up gaining significant concessions from the state and actually the, the recognition of their territorial autonomy, at least in name. But uh, the case study demonstrates how through these processes of uh, you know, gaining these institutional concessions from the state, uh, it actually ended up opening, opening the door uh, to mining extractivism uh, entering into the region. And how today the Pemon, even though you know, they were kind of able to mount this very effective resistance. The photo that you see there is, uh, you see that they were actually pulling down, physically pulling down the power lines uh, that today, uh, unfortunately, they're actually destroying their own territory by practicing mining on their own territory uh, that they said, you know, we see that this, this mining in our territory is inevitable. So it's better that we practice it ourselves on our own terms. And uh, another one of the case studies that we've been looking at is uh, the what has been termed the trash revolution in Lebanon. Uh, so this entailed, uh, it's a longstanding conflict involving trash management uh, and state corruption uh, that reached a boiling point with that the garbage was literally overflowing onto the streets. Uh, and this sparked a revolutionary movement. And uh, Rania Masri sort of dissects and understands what happened to this movement uh, over many years. And uh, this was uh, for Lebanon, you know, uh, definitely the first time that an environmental issue had sp has sparked a sort of nationwide mobilization. Uh, and one more case study, this was uh, carried out by Ashish Kotari, where he uh, works with weavers in India to understand their processes of transformation. So uh, I'll just share now some of the learnings on transforming power that have emerged from uh, the case studies that I mentioned and some of the, the other ones as well. Uh, so regarding institutional power. Uh, so throughout the case studies, we really see two, two types of approaches to this question of institutional power. Uh, 
Uh, one is working together with the state, uh, trying to get the state to, uh, you know, trying to work together with the state uh, to lead to these institutional transformations. And uh, the other one is really enacting these alternative institutions outside of the state system. Uh, so in the, you know, the first case, as I mentioned, uh, is you know the Pemon were able to have recognition of indigenous territorial autonomy, but through this recognition, actually the state was able to demobilize uh, the movement because they thought, well, we now have this recognition of our uh, indigenous sovereignty, but that recognition was never translated into actual power on the ground. Uh, so the state eventually use that to de demobilize them. Uh, whereas we have these existing, uh, we have these situations where communities are kind of creating their own institutions. Another case study from my colleague, Mariana Walter, uh, looks at, for example, uh, movements, um, referenda, community-led referenda against mining in Latin America. Uh, so this, in these situations, they're sort of, they're saying, well, we cannot trust the state to provide democratic decision-making for us. We're going to redraw uh, the lines of governance and put in place our own referenda. So that's an example, a more autonomous example of how you can recapture the democratic process and the type of social innovations that might emerge uh, from, from these processes. So certainly uh, the case studies show some of the, the risks, uh, the risks of engaging with the state and uh, how the state can sometimes use these processes of mobilize, uh, these processes of engagement uh, to demobilize. Uh, the, some takeaways from how we look at relational power. So we understand relational power is being built uh, through dialogue, deliberation, and collaboration between actors and leading to this formation of collective political agency. Uh, one thing we see is that uh, some of the most interesting relational power across all the case studies is that when it is forged uh, through alliances across difference. And this is often based on these productive frictions between actors that lead for uh, lead to the need for negotiation and this sort of re new subjectivities that are formed when we engage with the other and across forms of difference. Uh, interestingly, uh, I co-authored a chapter on uh, different, uh, different movements in Canada. We did a bit of a statistical analysis looking at the different conflicts and their transformative potential. And we also see that the more diversity of actors that's engaged in conflicts, uh, the, more, the more potential they have for success. And I'm happy to, uh, to discuss this a little bit more in the conversation. And then finally, uh, really looking at cultural power, uh, we see that uh, these resistances lead to the creations of new meanings and the breaking down of these binaries and divisions, and also to these new conceptions of nature and new place attachments. Uh, this was something that came out uh, really interestingly, for example, in this, uh, in the case of Haran, in the case against the, the prison in Kielbeck, uh, that this space that in, it was a natural space, but somewhat abandoned. And through the resistance movement, it becomes revalorized and people understand it in new terms. And actually it ended up transforming their entire relation with their, with their community. Um, so we see conflicts have this really uh, transformative role in how we relate with these ecologies around us. Um, and another major takeaway from this is that these conflicts uh, will, cannot really be sustained over time unless these processes of cultural re revitalization uh, and a focus on knowledge and value systems are happening. 
Uh, so this, as I mentioned, was um, from the, the, the struggle of the Pemon, Joaquin Rodriguez really says that was sort of the, the key weakness of the movement. They put their energies into how to negotiate and relate with the state, but they weren't able to strengthen their own understanding of what their uh, path of their own alternative development path was, what their internal decision making process was. Um, so without that sort of base in the cultural power transformations, it becomes very difficult to sustain the other type of power transformations that we have looked at and uh, really transformation of intercultural relations. Okay, I think, uh, oh, and one more. Uh, so in our chapter in looking at Canada, we kind of add one fourth form of power that we really uh, think is, is relevant uh, to, to adding to the other three. And we weren't, we didn't really see how it fit exactly. We call it physical power. And this is actually using uh, physical means to block uh, to block projects, uh, direct action to block these infrastructures of extractivism. Uh, so this is often manifested, manifested through blockades, land occupations, but it can also happen through this sort of alternatives on the ground that emerge. And sometimes these alternatives emerge uh, in the path of these extractive projects. So in the case of Kielbeck in the prison, you know, they were, uh, you know, in the, at the same time that they're resisting, they're building a permaculture garden, so on and so forth, or different uh, community owned uh, projects. And this type of res physical resistance, uh, it kind of carves out a space for the enactment of these prefigurative alternatives. So it allows you to create a space where you can enact these alternatives. And at the same time, uh, it buys time and allows you to physically block the extractive projects and the state violence. Of course, it also um, exposes you to the potential for considerable uh, direct physical violence and power. Um, and that's uh, perhaps, yeah, the how, how those dynamics work uh, regarding uh, repression uh, of these movements and uh, the potential for backfire, how these sort of state repression can sometimes lead to either demobilization or increased support for the movement, strengthening of the movement and actually new transformative move moments uh, is perhaps uh, something we could get into more in another talk or another day, but I'll just put it out there. Um, so, and just, just to end, I would like to also share this uh, graph that's from some, some other work that I did with some other colleagues uh, that just kind of tracks a little bit from an ecological economics perspective, how we see these transformative processes. So we understand that, uh, you know, changes in socio-ecological relations, what we call the social metabolism of society, uh, distributes environmental costs and uh, benefits amongst the population. And this maldistribution of uh, environmental costs lead to ecological distribution conflicts. And sometimes these conflicts can then uh, transform into collective action and uh, environmental justice movements are formed that mobilize to claim increased justice. Uh, so the environmental justice movements will make claims. Uh, and if they're successful, of course, it can lead towards uh, the type of sustainability transformations that we're talking about. And these transformations uh, reshape the social metabolism. They reshape the socio-ecological relations. And uh, of course, in this reshaping, uh, there's of course always the potential for new 
uh, forms of injustice and new maldistributions, which could potentially <laughs> lead us to, to restart this, this cycle once more. So, you know, uh, we don't, of course, these transformations are not linear. They don't have an end point. Uh, there's a lot of reversals and changes. Um, and they occur, as we mentioned, over over multiple scales, time scales, and uh, scales from the individual to the societal level. And I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Leah, for this um, presentation. Uh, as Elias was right, it's extremely interesting. Uh, right now, um, uh, I'd like to to open um, uh, for questions and comments from from our audience. So, please, if anyone would like to to start, uh, just raise your virtual hands, uh, and uh, we uh, we can begin it right now. Um, let me see. But yeah, no. Just, I will just get it started so because no one raised their hands yet. Um, uh, I think a, a good place to, to start, uh, at least one thing I was wondering is um, how what what has been your intellectual trajectory? Where how did you begin down this path? Um, where did I saw? Uh, yeah, I, I, I recognize when you talk about like the productive conflict, I recognize um, uh, the, the worker Ma Martinez Alier. I also saw that you co-authored a, a, a paper that you just cited with him. So, uh, and also you are, you, you teach at the, uh, at the uh, Autonomous University of Barcelona. So is there a connection? I don't know. Could you talk to us a little bit about how what your trajectory was like and what led you down this path? Sure. And yes, I have. I mean, I've been working with Martinez Alia for many, many years. He was the supervisor of my thesis, and the our original project. So we 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 started. Uh, doing different uh, European projects together. So, sorry to interrupt you, just to, because maybe some people don't know who Martinez Alier is. So maybe you could also uh, tell us uh, uh, who he is. Sure. Um, so Joan Martinez Alier is, well, I would say one of the fathers of ecological economics and in particular political ecological economics. Uh, and uh, one of his major contributions is the work on the environmentalism of the poor. Uh, so making uh, the distinction, uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so of course, uh, making a distinction from this understanding Understanding of environmentalism as um, a luxury good that you know we need to have access to to wilderness to the understanding of uh, environmental justice uh, the environmentalism of the poor that environmentalism is really about basic needs and communities uh, mobilizing for uh, access to resources that they need for their livelihood um, so. Uh, so we've been working, collaborating for a long time, and um, our first project was called CSEC, uh, and that was uh, kind of the first thing about very explicitly working with social movements and NGOs and saying, how can we translate, uh, how can we make ecological economics relevant for uh, practitioners and movements on the ground. How can we, try, you know, in ecological economics, we talk a lot, as I mentioned, about social metabolism, uh, multiple forms of valuation. So how can you, how can you engage in valuation beyond the monetary? Um, but translating these tools so that they are usable and accessible is 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 complicated you know there's a lot of uh there's a lot of interest from ngos in monetary valuation to give you one example like oh if i could just 
put a money a price on this forest, then the policymakers will be so convinced that we should preserve it. Um, so a lot of uh, my work and our work has been contesting that perspective. But then if you contest it, you need to say, well, what are the alternatives? Uh, alternative processes you can offer to communities. What are these other tools? And I think, yeah, this work, uh, it's still still only partially done or uh, there's still a lot of work to do in this, but the CSIC uh, was an attempt to do that. And we, we published uh, one book that was a handbook called Ecological Economics from the Ground Up. So that was a smaller project. And then we uh, conceived together the project called uh, EJOLT, Environmental Justice Organizations, Liabilities and Trade, uh, that involved 23 organizations at that point, uh, acad academic and activist groups. And that was where we began working on the Global Atlas of Environmental Justice. So that project was my initiative. It was like my little baby <laughs> within the project. Um, and we worked with, um, you know, groups that had been doing this work of documenting these conflicts together with frontline movements. Most of them had been doing this work for like 20 to 30 years. Uh, but as I mentioned previously, there, there's no global source to document these types of conflicts. Uh, so we began building, building the atlas towards uh, that end. Um, so, yeah, that's that's a bit about uh, where I'm coming from, of course, like my focus is environmental justice, political ecology. Uh, also, uh, I have a master's in economic history with a focus on agrarian history and environmental history as well. Uh, thank you. No, that's very interesting to, to understand where you're coming from. So now we, we have a question from Inza. So Inza, please uh, take it away. Yeah, thank you. I don't know how internal or external your group is here. So my name is Insa Tiesfeld from the Martin Luther University in Halle. And I came to your talk via announcement in the newsletter. I'm, I'm really fascinated by the many case studies you have and maybe by the possibility to bring in some dynamics here in how power structures can help you to bring in success to transformative processes. So my question would be, can you, can you build on this richness and maybe say if these various forms of power you introduce, do they show up in a different order? Like I'm particularly interested, for instance, in this physical power, as I also worked a little bit with that, and it is actually core and important. But is it from your experience maybe first and then it transforms into cultural power. So do you need this physical um, fight in the beginning to get the movement going? Or is that something that starts if cultural and power over is not successful and then this physical power comes in? So, so what can we learn from your comparison of cases? Hmm. Oh, but that's a really interesting question. And yeah, regarding the cases, I have to say, so, I mean, so this acknowledges is, is kind of looking at these in-depth case studies. I should mention that a lot of my research uh, has also looked at uh, analyzed uh, case studies in the Atlas, for example, you know, doing uh, much uh, with a much larger NSAT. So, you know, right now we have 3,600 uh, plus cases in the atlas so we've also we can't do the same we can't look at in this way like the type of question you ask because of course this question of the timing of different strategies we don't have that coded for the atlas but we do <coughs> we do look at some of these questions across uh you know a wide uh set of cases as well um and to your question about the the sort of timing of uh, the different power dynamics, so I think that's that would be something really interesting to look at. Um, but I my we haven't looked at it in that way. I would say, but my feeling is that it it will be very contextual. Um, and just to give you an example, I mean, 
this idea of doing a life plan uh, that some indigenous communities have been engaging in, uh, you know, the 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 right moment to do this life plan is actually before any sort of project would be to come into your territory. Uh, so you right away when when you're not in a moment of extreme pressure, uh, time pressure, the conflicts and the divisions that these projects inevitably bring into a community uh, begin to surface. Uh, so, you know, you already begin to lay out what would happen if, if, you know, if we are to be proposed uh, some type of project from an external force, what would that have to look like for us? What is the process we will use? What's the decision-making process we will use? Where do we actually want to go? You know, what is our vision before it, this new vision is, is imposed upon us, so on and so forth. So that would be the ideal processes. And in and when I think back to Canada, for example, I mean, the um, like there has been a lot of focus, for example, on these elements of cultural revitalization. So there's been a lot of work on revitalizing indigenous languages, so on and so forth. And then some indigenous scholars have critiqued that that work, the cultural work, has not translated to the institutional power that's necessary on the ground. Um, and even, you know, there's also been for example, a great deal of blockades, for example. So this manifestation of physical power, but it doesn't always translate into the forms of institutional power that, that is necessary or that's needed. And, and, you know, why is that? Is that, and some of that to a degree, some people might say, well, this is a problem of relational power because you have hundreds of separate indigenous communities that each have their own vision. And then you don't necessarily have a strong structure that's bringing them together with a shared vision, right? So I think, um, and then if you look at the case of um, the, the, the case in Lebanon, uh, this is a very particular case and uh, demonstrates some, some of these dynamics in interesting ways because uh, so Lebanon, the political structure in Lebanon is based on a system of a clientelism uh, and patronage along sectarian lines. So, you know, the actual political power is structured in that you have seats in parliament that are reserved depending on which sect you are a part of. And these sects uh, gain power by, uh, you know, they kind of distribute resources amongst the population. Uh, so, you know, part of the, what Rania Masri, who's actually, she uh, is, you know, part of a political movement to undo the entire political system. But, um, you know, she really talks about the different challenges that they, that they face in, 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 in confronting the political system when all the resources currently are distributed through this political system. So it, um, yeah, in that case, it, it becomes quite complicated because to a degree they have to redo the, I mean, what they're calling for is this sort of undoing in a sense of the cultural power that is existing, that is vested in these different sects uh, and groups that have this historical trajectory. It's almost the, the reverse in a sense of the process that many indigenous communities need to do. That's the first time that that just occurred to me, but nice to, to be talking about these things. So I'm not sure if I answered your question, but uh, yeah, just some reflections on how we might, we might look at some of these dynamics. Thank you, Leah. Um, so, uh, Elias, yeah, you are next. Uh, thanks. Yeah, thanks for, for the super interesting talk. Um, I was just uh, sort of what from what you were just saying and thinking about the atlas as well and the many case studies. Um, I've been thinking a little bit about this 
um, this this paradox that on the one hand you're dealing with like very localized forms of resistance that are um, against you know very concrete kind of extractive projects or a prison that's being built and so on. And on the other hand, you're gathering at them at like a very global scale and lots and lots of different uh, forms of resistance and so on. And so I'm wondering if the value of that kind of collection is purely analytical to be able to like study better these processes and then help, I don't know, communities uh, do resistance better, or if there is any kind of normative value also to making these connections and to making them globally. Um, I, I just had to think about how uh, uh, in Taiwan, where I have been living for some time, uh, the indigenous um, movement only really started uh, identifying as an indigenous movement as a result of the sort of global um, United Nations uh, declarations and rights of indigenous people and so on, and, and making new connections, for instance, with indigenous movements in New Zealand and other places. Um, before that, that had never really been identity, and that sort of opened up also possibilities for uh, sort of transnational coordination of these sorts of struggles, which I would think may, may still be important because otherwise, how do we make sure the local instances of resistance don't just amount to a kind of nimbyism where, okay, don't build a prison in our neighborhood, but you know, we're not going to fight if you build it at the other end of town. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I definitely agree with that. And I think, I, I don't think, I mean, what we are seeing in a lot of these struggles is that uh, the, this, I mean, the transformation in consciousness uh, means that these are not NIMBY struggles, uh, at least the ones we've been, we've been studying. So you know, this, uh, the study, like the analysis of the struggle against the prison, um, it, it actually leads to this consciousness about prison abolition altogether. Uh, so, you know, often the rallying cry is not here, not anywhere. And uh, that movement, for example, um, so it's called a ZAD. Is, is anyone familiar with the term ZAD? Zona Defendre. So that actually is something that, like that movement in, in Belgium was uh, inspired, of course, by the original ZAD, the Zona Defendre, which was a struggle in France against uh, in Nantes, in France against a mega airport. That, uh, that's a struggle, historical struggle that's been going on for over 40 years, successful one where the airport was, uh, the airport was actually canceled and they kind of have created this sort of uh, anti-capitalist uh, utopia community there. And then you see like inspired by that struggle, there's been hundreds of spaces that now call themselves ZADs that have emerged across Europe um, kind of sharing a lot of the these underlying ideas. So they, you know, they are inserted often into these, uh, yeah, into these transnational movements. The those movements are also part of a, a network, a European network that's called uh, the um, movement against unnecessary and imposed infrastructure. Uh, so it's basically questioning the debate. What are the basic processes for these infrastructure projects? How do we decide when a type of infrastructure project is necessary? So they're not, uh, I really, you know, in many cases we see that uh, even if it kind of the initial motivation might be nimbyism through the processes of interaction, uh, through the process of collective empowerment and through gathering the knowledge that you need to contest the project, uh, you end up uh, really expanding and amplifying uh, the terms of the struggle. So that is the transformative process. And then of course, we see how those movements, the new forms of social innovation, the new knowledge then translates 
to new struggles and new movements. So, you know, in that particular case, he was saying how some of the people uh, mobilizing against that prison, that that prison was actually built in the end. I was looking in the internet and I saw that the like architecture firm that built it, they're like say, this is a green prison and they won all these awards for the prison design. Um, but how they be, you know, they later went on to become key actors in the prison abolition movement in Belgium altogether. Um, the the struggles like this, uh, also we see how different strategies and forms of mobilization translate across contexts. So, you know, Mariana Walter's work, she looked at this, uh, the local, the work on local consultations, and she tracks how it has moved across communities in Latin America, and it's been used in different ways. Uh, so there's also this translation in terms of uh, the, the forms of struggle. Thank you, Leah. Uh, next question from Isadora Cardoso. Hi, Isadora, please. Hi, um, good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Leah, for this really interesting talk and um, presenting your work. I personally really like and find fascinating the Environmental Justice Atlas. Um, it's very val uh, valuable work um, that you're doing. Um, I'm curious to know, because we know that for many environmental justice uh, groups and environmental activists and defenders, um, the issue of security is very important. And um, many groups don't even like to share much about their strategies or how they organize, where they're based. So, um, and you also cited a, a case where one of the groups had more recognition, I think, after the, I don't know if it's, it was connected to the, to the identification in the, in the Atlas, uh, but not necessarily tr it translated into like um, benefits to the group in the end. So my question would be, um, how do you deal with that in your project? How do you deal with the question of security of especially those groups which identify those struggles so that this doesn't really turn into, I don't know, um, something like um, against their own struggles. Um. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the this is something that came up a lot uh, initially when we were coming up with the Atlas. Um, and I mean, what I can say is that the the cases we document in the Atlas, so it's based on public information. Um, I mean, and, and I think that, I'm not sure if this is your question exactly, but the question that we got a lot was, uh, can this information be leveraged by extractive companies, for example, against movements? That was like a major concern that we had when building the map. Um, and it, it is a question that I get a lot. So I can just say that, uh, you know, we've always had that consideration in mind and that we had the, the opposite impression, like communities actually feel they want to be included uh, in the Atlas. These struggles are already uh, public, so actually that's generally one of the preconditions for, for being in the Atlas is that there should be some sort of media or published information about these struggles. Uh, there's been some cases where that wasn't the case or uh, it was only, you know, and actually you will have that when the communities are extremely marginalized, the cases will not even be published in the national media. Uh, so I remember we had one case uh, about a landfill and it was a minority community of ethnic Albanians and they, they wrote us. And the only documentation would have been in their local newspaper because even, you know, even the national newspapers would never cover the case. So they, you know, worked with us to add their case to the Atlas. Um, so, yeah, so, and, and I mean, we see, I, I do 
think that I do, I do know that uh, extractive companies and others are using the Atlas and even uh, insurance companies have contacted us to say that they would like to use the Atlas sort of to set premiums for mining companies in different countries to kind of talk about the, the possibility of social conflict. Um, all of that, I mean, in a sense, like the aim in a sense of many of these projects is to increase the cost of engaging in this type of oppressive extractive activities to the point where it's no longer sustainable. So anything we are doing to contribute to increasing those costs, to making those costs visible, I think that it's actually helpful and it shows the strength of the movement and shows that you can't, uh, you know, just go in anywhere and force your way into any community. No, there's these processes of resistance and these projects are often successful. So some of our more meta analysis is really analyzing, you know, what percentage of the projects are successful. Um, and what are some of the costs, for example, to business as usual through this resistance, which I think is often invisibilized. It's not really taken into account. Uh, so, you know, from our analysis in Canada, there's, uh, you know, there's been some analysis, like you're talking about billions of dollars that are lost because of the resistances on the ground. Uh, and many, many, many projects have been canceled because of these resistances. So we, we do want to make this more evident. Is there a chance that like this analysis of strategies, mobilization uh, will be used by, by extractive industries? Perhaps, yes. Although, yeah, some of my, they, some of it's quite crude, their, their work. So yeah. I, I, I would say that the, the danger is there, but we, we are attentive to it. And I think on balance, uh, the feedback from movements is that uh, they actually use the resource a lot. And for them, it's important to, to, to be there and to show the, to have that visibility because these movements are often invisibilized. Thank you, Leah. Alexandra, you're next. Yeah, also from my side, thanks for your uh, wonderful presentation and uh, also the debate. Uh, I'm, I was very intrigued because you uh, said that um, uh, when you talked about diversity in the movements and the intersections and the productive frictions that uh, can strengthen protests, you said that you are willing to discuss this. <laughs> so I'm quite interested in uh, what, um, yeah, what, what are like points of discussion for that? Because for me, it's very clear that uh, generally it is, uh, it's, it's very helpful for exactly what you said, like to have those productive frictions and also, uh, yeah, to, to um, while you're uh, in activism, like to see what, what do others think, what are other perspectives on it and then like refine what you're asking for and for example I have been uh, following closely what has been happening in Chile um, or what is happening in Chile and I think that was one of the biggest uh, strengths of what has been happening there to have like so many diverse movements and so many diverse actors uh, exchanging but um, I was trying to figure out what you might have wanted to refer to. And I was wondering like maybe the limits of the diversity, like uh, who, who would be actors that you don't want to include or that you don't want to discuss with. So yeah, I'm very intrigued to hear what you wanted to say with that. Yeah. Um, so I think, I mean, I think what we need, I, I just think the important thing there is to, to be cognizant of the the realities of the conflicts that actually happen in within movements so what are these micro politics that are taking place 
And, you know, throughout the stages of this collective action, you will have moments where there is this type of cohesion and the conflicts and tensions are productive and other moments where the conflicts and tensions become such that it completely splits the movement apart and leads to divisions. And of course, that is sort of, I think, one of the key strategies of the state and extractive industries is to identify uh, what those divisions are and how they can be better leveraged because that's pro probably one of the most effective ways uh, to, to demobilize people. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, I mean, there, there's many, many examples uh, and it's, I mean, you have to realize that people come to these conflicts uh, with different objectives, different frames, uh, and, you know, different even understandings about what the conflict is about, um, like to use one kind of well-known example uh, that was the conflicts in the U.S. over the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, so for the indigenous people that were involved in the conflict, uh, this was a conflict about water, essentially. Uh, then you have, and you see something similar with the Zad, the, the, the case I mentioned in, in France with the Nantes. Then you have many activists that are coming and they see this about climate justice because it's about a pipeline. So, you know, they come and they try to impose their frame and their discourse onto what this conflict is about. Is it about climate or is it about indigenous sovereignty and them defending their water resources? Um, and the questions become then like, well, to what, to what degree is it helpful to have this support from these other actors, these uh, let's say external actors that have their own understanding of what the conflict is and what point does it lead to uh you know irreconcilable let's say differences where you could get to the point where it says well you know please um please you know we don't we don't want your support anymore right um so that's kind of that would be one example of how you might have these type of conflicts. Uh, and of course, this is a very common theme uh, with uh, conflicts like the relationship between indigenous peoples and environmentalists that we look at in the Canadian case, because if you're asking for your autonomy, that could, and in, like in the case of the Pemon, it's they're asking for their autonomy and that autonomy later turns into, we have the, autonomy and sovereignty to extract and the environmentalists will say but but wait <laughs> you know that, that wasn't supposed to be the plan so there you see that you have these different types of values right and and which one is more important in any moment are you supporting indigenous people so that they have full sovereignty and can take the decision or are you only supporting them if they're going to have the environmental values that you would like them to have um, there's other, you know, in some of my other work, for example, I also looked, uh, there was this, uh, like this, uh, this case in the Tana Delta, uh, where there's been like long standing conflict between pastoralists and agriculturalists. And then you have a third actor coming in, uh, like with a major land grabbing project. And, uh, for the first time you have this like marriage of convenience, right? I call it a marriage of convenience where these communities that have been uh, historically always at conflict say, well, you know, we need to unite against this common enemy, stop the project. Uh, but is that really going to lead to a transformative understanding of difference and new relations once the external enemy is gone? Uh, not necessarily, right? So there's, I think, yeah, I, I would just say that these, these tensions can be very productive, 
but they can also rip the movements apart. And this is uh, in the case of Lebanon, uh, she also discusses that there was different two streams within the movement. And this is another key difference. It's not, it's based more on the political vision. So, you know, you have from one perspective, it's like, what is our analysis of this conflict? Is this a technical issue? Is this a technical conflict about waste management? And if we can, you know, and put more of an environmental framing and a lens on it and find a way to resolve uh, how we are going to manage waste. And it's about recycling. It's about reuse, it's about waste reduction, or is this a real deeper issue about political corruption and accountability? So if the movements are not sharing that same process of problem analysis, uh, of course, they're gonna take very, very different tacks. And then uh, the government can then use, like begin speaking to one side or the other, and this leads to processes of like splintering off or weakening of these movements. So those are some of like, those are just some examples of the, the types of differences that you can encounter that could be productive or not, or productive in some moments and, and not in others. Um, so I, I think that's kind of one of the key questions. How do you, how do you have this kind of talking across difference so that it, so that it, it, doesn't lead to division and remains productive. Thanks, Leah. Before we wrap up, we're approaching the end of the lecture. There is one practical question I was, would like to ask you. Uh, a lot of our audience is, you know, based in the global north. Uh, we are based in Germany, you're based in Canada. I was wondering if based on your experience, both um, as an activist and as a researcher, what do you, how do you envision or what do you think uh, our role both as researchers or in um, uh, activism that we might do uh, in, in particular uh, regarding um, envi environmental issues? What's, the, what's our role here, us who are in the so-called the core countries, uh, core capitalist countries? Uh, how do you, what do you think our responsibility uh, is and, and how do you envision also that this uh, uh, transformative research approach uh, can be better, uh, uh, more, more effectively applied? And, and also if you have any closing words uh, and, and uh, before we wrap up, uh, uh, please, yeah, that this would be a good moment. Okay. Thanks. Um, well, yeah, so definitely uh, just to say that I, I mean, it's not necessarily like, you know, we use the term, people increasingly use the term global south to talk about the south in the north. So in Canada, for example, uh, there's many indigenous communities that uh, still don't have clean drinking water that people find it extremely shocking but uh, it's not so even within the core countries let's say of course uh, there's still uh, this this vast inequalities that we need to we need to consider um so what is our role I mean the 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 perspective that we've been trying to take in the project is uh, to play this role of uh, supporting communities in their own transformative projects. And, um, you know, where we can also supporting them with resources, supporting them with our own time and resources. Um, so, yeah, not being completely organic intellectuals in that sense but um yeah trying to be uh like in a, a situation of allyship as well with with the movements and seeing how our research can support their transformative processes and how uh as activist researchers we can support them uh in other ways uh, so that's that has been our general approach. And for example, when we hold our meetings, 
Uh, for example, in India or in Turkey, we invite communities to participate as well in person. So uh, it's not only like you not having this process of speaking on their behalf. Uh, community members are co-authors as well on uh, many of the, the different chapters in the book. So not having that dividing line in terms of who is creating knowledge. Uh, we don't consider ourselves as the, 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 those who are creating knowledge. The knowledge is, is really created uh, in the communities through their processes. And we see ourselves, our role more really as translating the, that knowledge uh, based on their needs. So that's some of the just kind of as approaches to research that some of the, the elements that we take into account. The other one uh, is um, like the, the process that I mentioned to you about uh, the reflexive processes that we constantly need to have as we do this research that is uh, in collaboration with communities. So it's easy to say that we're doing transdisciplinary research, but how do we make sure, how do we check in uh, and what are the processes of reflexivity that we constantly need to re return to uh, throughout the research process? So for that, we've we created this process of uh, what we term uh, political rigor. What does it mean to do politically rigorous research? We talk about academically rigorous research, but what is political? What would political rigor in research look like? And I have a, a PhD student. That's the focus of her PhD. She should be finishing soon. <laughs> um, so that that's I think in terms of um, in terms of the research part, I would say that's that that that's some of the, the answer. The other thing I guess is in terms of our role as as citizens, uh, what can we do to contest these processes? I mean, I think I think a lot of the work actually, and that's kind of I'm, now I'm I've actually moved. I'm I'm working now as a full time activist. Um, and uh, it's it's really f focusing on this cultural power and the hegemonic thoughts because uh, even when we talk about transformations to sustainability, even now as we are talking about this sort of accelerated transition that Germany is going through in relation to the cutting off of Russian gas, uh, it's it's very like the the limits of what's possible are very constrained. Um, there's so like what you can say in public uh, is extremely <laughs> limited. If you were to propose um, ideas like bring up ideas like degrowth or uh, restructuring of how we consume energy or even come up with the idea that, you know, what if we were to change our energy consumption based to a degree on the natural cycles? Like, this is what farmers and communities all around the world do everywhere. So just proposing that sort of idea, I mean, it, it's, it's basically not proposed. It's, it's, in, it's unthinkable to begin to propose these sort of thoughts. So I think that, the, you know, being more vocal, like with these transformative thoughts, unpopular thoughts, so on and so forth, it's how we begin to win cultural space, because these ideas take a long time time to percolate you know I created a film about degrowth I think it was the first documentary about degrowth that was about 12 maybe 12 13 years ago I don't know how long I was living in the states at the time I couldn't even I was at Berkeley in the university I could not even talk about it people would look at me like huh like it, even in even in Berkeley <laughs> it was not possible to talk about at all people just thought I was crazy now, 13 years later, in academic circles, it's everybody is 
willing to talk about degrowth. So how is that then going to be expanding to wider audiences? Um, so, you know, ideas and cultural change, it, it happens very slowly. If, you know, and as academics, people that are working on creating narratives, disseminating knowledge, yeah, I think there's a necessity to be a little bit more bold and radical and to integrate these ideas of challenging uh, oppressive structural conditions in our work. So I think that's our other responsibility. Yeah, I think I can leave it there. Great. Yeah, so that's a great note to end on. Like, dream, dream, be more ambitious in our dreams. Uh, that's a fantastic note to end on. Thank you so much, Leah, for this uh, uh, amazing and informative and inspiring lecture. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I would just like to to ask everyone to to um, uh, Sign, subscribe to our newsletter. Also, we have created a new Twitter account so people can follow the news uh, from our uh, our events and announcements. Uh, it's justice underline IASS, so on Twitter. And uh, um, yeah, in the next lecture will be on May 19th at the same time. Uh, at 5 p.m. Uh, Central European time with uh, Tasnim Isop on civil society and climate forums, the challenges to building consensus around climate justice. And so look up on our website for more information on how to sign up. Uh, yeah, thank you so much everyone for participating and thank you again, Leah, for, for joining us. So thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It was lovely. Thanks to all of you. Okay, bye.